So for those of you who have a copy of the syllabus or you want to look at one that's being passed around right now, I, I've tried to give us a, a real diversity of readings. And I especially, you know, one of the things that's kind of odd about this class, odd in a, in a to me, good way, it's kind of the anti-American heritage class. And I, I mean that in the sense that we're going to be looking a lot from the perspective of the American Indians at a lot of things. And so, whereas if you think about the American heritage class, you start at Plymouth Rock and you just move inevitably all the way to Rodeo Drive. And you know, once you're there, you're there. And that, that's kind of the narrative, and it's a, I love it, it's a fine narrative. But we're gonna be standing, for example, at times in St. Louis, and we're gonna be standing in San Antonio. We're gonna be thinking about Santa Fe, New Mexico from the perspective of what an indigenous person might look like. So I don't wanna suggest that this is an anti-Hillsdale course, it's not at all. But certainly we're gonna be looking at things from a variety, a variety of perspectives. And so I wanted to give you a variety of perspectives in the readings as well. So one of the books that I, I assigned, which will be part of the first semester, is this book by R. David Edmonds, who's a professor in Texas, a great, great scholar, but his biography of Tecumseh, a really wonderful look at this very interesting Indian chief in Northern Ohio and Northern Indiana during the War of 1812. He doesn't survive, he's killed in 1813, and that's part of the story, that he is kind of defined by his British allegiance there and fought against America. But for those of you from Ohio, you know that they still have the Tecumseh pageant every year, which is really wild. I mean, we celebrate this guy who was an enemy, an avowed enemy of the United States. He's also, for those of you who've been to the Naval Academy, He's one of the statues that greets you when you're at one of the six gates of the Naval Academy. And th this is something we're gonna have to talk about during the semester. Why is it that we tend to take our enemies and make heroes out of them? Uh, what is it? What is it about the American Indian? We don't do that. I mean, can you imagine if we had a statue of Hitler in front of the Naval Academy? I mean, that, we would never, ever do anything like that. But we don't have a problem doing it with Indians. I mean, think about when the, the Airborne guys, I can't remember if it's the 101st or the 82nd, when they jump out and they yell Geronimo. Geronimo was a corruption of St. Jerome. It's where it comes from. Uh, that's what the Mexicans would yell in prayer as they were about to be killed by Geronimo. They would yell St. Jerome, and that's how he got his name Geronimo uh, from that. But you know, imagine he was an absolute enemy of the United States, and yet we're yelling his name in terms of support as we jump out of planes. So th this is a rare thing for us, and yet it's not so uncommon when we're thinking about the American Indian. There's this respect that we always have for them that's latent throughout all of American history. Even at the moment we're brutalizing them, even at the moment we're putting them on reservations, we still have this incredible respect for them. And we have to talk about that a lot this semester. Why is that the case? And what is it about the kind of character of the American Indian that lends itself so much to that idea? And many of you have probably seen images from the Nez Perce War of Chief Joseph, one of the, the great American Indian chiefs, and he is intentionally always portrayed as a Roman Stoic. Whenever he, his image comes up, they've taken a picture of Seneca and they've redrawn it for Chief Joseph. And so you have this familiar feeling when you see Chief Joseph, you know this guy, he's familiar yet it's Seneca, it's a, a Roman Stoic, and we'll talk about that a lot in this class. The other book, and this is the book that you'll read in the second half of the semester, on American Indians, is one of my all-time favorite books. If somebody pushed me, you know, Brad, give me the top best 10 books you've ever read. I would actually put this probably in the top 10 books, along with Cicero and some others. Uh, it's a biography, strangely enough, and I hope you've all had a chance to get it but called The Lance and the Shield, which is a life of Sitting Bull. And Robert Utley, I don't know if he's still alive or not. I should be careful because <laughs> I'm recording this too. Um, I'm not sure if he's still around. He's a, he's a great historian. He was the historian of the National Park Service for years and years at the end of the 20th century. And just an incredible guy. But what he tries to do is look at the life of Sitting Bull from the perspective of a Roman. What do you do if you fought, encountered this element in your life? What do you do if you encounter this? 
And so he tries to look at the virtues, and he finds four virtues that exist in Sitting Bull. And none of these virtues are going to be things that we should be shocked at. The only thing we're shocked at is it's not shocked about is that it's not coming from the Greeks or the Romans. It's coming from an indigenous tribe, from the Sioux, from the Lakota, uh, specifically from the Ogwala. Or Hunk Papa, I'm sorry, it was Hunk Papa. You'll start learning Indian names, too, in here. Uh, one of the things that's both good and bad is there are a lot of... For those of you who had Dr. Stewart, you have to name all the capitals and all the states. Imagine naming 50 Indian tribes you've never heard of before. So that will be part of the joy of this semester. You're going to get to know a lot of Indian tribes in here. So anyway, first semester, our first half of the semester, we'll talk about Tecumseh. In the second half of this semester, we'll talk about Sitting Bull. But I, I promise you, no one's going to be bored with these books. They're great books, and uh, great in the sense of really giving us a good insight into the lives of these people. So I'm not going to give you a paper on either of those books. I'm just going to presume that uh, and assume that you're all going to read it. So you'll read Tecumseh for the first half, you'll read Sitting Bull for the second half, and there will be a question, uh, probably an essay question, on the final and on the midterm. So midterm first, obviously, on Tecumseh, and then on the final on Sitting Bull. So that's the way I'm going to test you on having read those. Uh, and we'll talk about them some in class. But mostly it's going to be on your own that you will read those. So then I also wanted to give us two works of fiction uh, for a lot of reasons. These are not meant to be, this, this comes from my American Studies background, not necessarily from my historical background. I want you to read two novels by Willa Cather. The first one is called Death Comes for the Archbishop. That's for the first half of the semester. And for the second half of the semester, My Antonia. And I will freely admit, and my wife knows this, and I tease her about it, but I was madly in love with Antonia when I met my wife. So Antonia was my first girlfriend. <laughs> um, she, you can't, you can't help but fall in love with her. She is kind of an earth goddess in this story, but just an amazing figure. And uh, you'll see that right from the beginning, especially when you get into this novel and you're reading about Jim and Jim trying to figure out what his relationship was to Antonia. He had been in love with her as a young man as well, but his life went in a radically different direction from hers. What Cather is so good at is getting into the various ethnicities and understandings of those ethnicities as they settle on the, in America. So whether it's the perspective of Father Joseph or of uh, Archbishop Latour in Death Comes from the Archbishop, or of Jim, or of, of Antonia. In My Antonia, you're constantly learning very accurately what it was like to be an immigrant, what it was like to be a settler on the American frontier. And Cather's a beautiful writer. They, from the moment that you pick her up, you're going to notice the lilt in her writing. There, there's a, a great kind of there's an energy in her writing, but there's a real, I don't even know how to put it exactly, that there's a form that she follows in terms of kind of creating a fairy tale for adults. And you can feel that in the flow of the novel, of both novels themselves. There are actually, uh, how many people in here have read Death Comes? And a few of you? Uh, for those of you who've read Death Comes, there's even a horror scene in it that's straight out of Lovecraft. Uh, it's really fascinating, and we're going to talk about that. It's one of the most important scenes where we encounter paganism raw, and they're, they're basically uh, aborting children. They're killing, uh, practicing infanticide. And Cather gives us this look into what that means and how different it is to be a Christian looking at this pagan practice as opposed to being the pagan. And you know, paganism can be fun, but it can also be really brutal. And that's part of what you see in the story as well. So I, excellent book. Again, both of these, I think, I'll be shocked if you don't like them. We will talk about them in class, but once again, there'll be an essay on each one of these, one on the midterm and one on the final. So that's how, again, I'll be testing you. So for both the books on the American Indians and on Willa Cather's novels. So I'll give you a study guide before the midterm and before the final and probably two or three questions that I might ask about each book but just so you have some kind of warning about that as you go into it. Uh, so please don't, I, I know it's easy at this point in the semester, 15 weeks seems like a long time. And of course, when you're in college, every week is loaded with so many things going on. But don't push those books off, uh, really don't push them off. Start reading them as soon as you can. 
and make sure that you're getting a good grasp on those because I also have a big assignment for you in here. And so there's going to be a lot going on. So just make sure that you keep up with both of those. To go along with those, I am going to show quite a few film clips during the class, and I hope everyone's okay with that. Uh, it actually used to drive me crazy when I was a kid and a teacher would put on a film because it was clearly done out of laziness. <laughs> I'm not doing it out of laziness. I'm doing it uh, in large part out of excitement, but also because of all the kinds of things that we study outside of World War II, nothing has been more defined by film, no subject in American history has been more defined by film than the American West has. And there's a certain age demographic to it. So I, I was born in 1967 and I was just on the very end of these Westerns. But for the generation ahead of me, especially for my parents' generation, all the way from the 20s up until the 60s, Westerns were always the main genre in film. And so, as you'll see, if you had a chance to look through the list of people that you're welcome to write on, one of the persons that you're welcome to write on is John Ford. And I actually wouldn't even mind if someone wanted to write on John Wayne. I think he's a critical figure in all of us trying to figure out what the 20th century is about, but also how those westerns are portrayed. So we're mostly going to watch film clips. We're not going to watch entire movies, but just some film clips of various things in here. And probably once a week, I doubt if we'll do it every class, but I do want to give you warning that we will be doing that in here. And I, as you look at those, and I'll remind you of this as we're watching the film, I, I want you to think about it as though you're a film studies major. So when we're watching a film, you're going to be entertained. There's nothing I'm going to show you that's not, I think, interesting in one way or another that will be taken with from an entertainment standpoint. But I want you to think about camera angles. I want you to think about lighting. I want you to think about dialogue, what the director is trying to do. And nobody does it better than John Ford. I mean, John Ford in the way that he stages everything. And he is so particular about stance. He's so particular about specific enunciation, how people are doing, what they're doing, and they're interacting. And we'll talk about that. So after we watch the clip, we'll talk about its historical significance, but also what the kind of artistry is that goes into that. In the same way that we're going to look at the artistry of Willa Cather and of Dave Edmonds and of Robert Utley as well, uh, not just the historical element. So I'm going to break the course down into three grades and typical for a, a 400 level class. You have a semester long research paper that I'll talk about in just a moment that's worth a third of your grade or just right below a third of your grade. Your midterm exam, which will be on October 14th, that's in week eight, so it's just slightly past midway through the course. Uh, so you'll have your midterm on October 14th. That will cover, of course, the first half of the semester and it will be comprehensive and it'll be a mix. Uh, it'll, it'll take the full time. So your 75 minutes, it will be a mix of essay, ID, and short answers. So three different parts to that. And then you'll have your final, which is worth 40%. So everything in the class is really moving towards the final. And I even expect for you, as you're writing your research paper, to kind of think about many of the, many of the larger questions that we have in class and what that means in terms of how you might take the final. So your paper should not be separate from the final. They should actually be a part of it in terms of the questions that you're asking. So I'll talk about that in just a second, but hopefully that makes sense. So those are the three grades in here. So your paper, your midterm, and your final. No quizzes. Uh, I'm not going to give any kind of daily quizzes at all. I'm going to assume that you're keeping up with the reading and obviously pay attention and so forth during class and I'll, I'll be if you get a quiz in here, that means things went south really quickly. <laughs> so and I'm not planning on that happening. Uh, oh, and, and for those of you from the south, apologies. That was probably offensive. But anyway, um, so. Okay, your research paper. Uh, believe it or not, uh, even though I've not taught this class since 2014, but in my upper levels, I always assign a research paper like this. Students usually end up loving the research paper. And part of that is because this is your chance to really bring your own personality to the work that we're doing in here. And so the theme I chose for this class for our, and, and you can kind of play with it a little bit, and I played with it a little bit, if you can look at the various possibilities of topics. But the theme I want us to think about is personality and biography. So this is why I chose only individuals for you to write on. So if there's something you're really interested in, Maybe uh, one of the great, great massacres, uh, like the Bear River Massacre, 
if that's something that you're just really interested in, well, then you can focus on that by focusing on one of the individuals that was involved in that. So if you are really interested in an event, you can at least think about it in terms of how it affected some individual. So you can play off that. So even though I want you to write about an individual, that's not erasing the events. It's pretty hard to separate events from individuals unless we're talking about just a natural catastrophe. And then, of course, even with a natural catastrophe, we're talking about how it affects us and how it affects human culture and human personality. So everything in here, in some way, is going to be related to the theme of biography. And of course, I gave you two biographies to read, and the two books that we're reading in here, the two fiction works, are essentially biographical works that Cather is, is giving us in some way or another. So biography is really important, as I see it, in terms of trying to understand history. So. I'm assigning this paper right now, at this moment, at 1.17, on whatever today is, uh, on this Thursday. I'm assigning the paper now, and I'll, I'll remind you throughout the semester that you need to be working on the paper, but the assignment is now. And so I expect you to start working on it as soon as you can. I do have a synopsis due on September 16th, which is a Thursday, and you can just turn that into me right at the beginning, beginning of class that day. But I would ask for a, a one-page write-up of what your topic is. So about half of that one page, you know, single space, uh, write me. It doesn't have to be really formal. It can be, Dear Dr. Berzer, this is what I'm writing. It can be like a nice email without grammatical mistakes. Uh, but you, know, you can write me some kind of email that says, this is what I'm writing on. This is what my topic is. These are the kinds of questions I'm asking. And these are the things that I hope to find. But of course, you won't know that until you turn your final paper in. But these are the things that I expect I'll find. This is what's important. And then for the second half of that, again, just one, one sheet is fine. Uh, give me your bibliography so far. What kinds of things have you found? And I've given you a list here. If you'll see towards the bottom of the, the section that I have, the research paper, it, we have so many databases at the library. And the librarians, especially George Allen, uh, is fantastic for getting help for all of this. But things like the Western Americana file, we had a professor, I took this class from him, a professor by the name of John Wilson. Some of you may know him, he's still very active in the community. But John was in charge of a donation back in the 1980s, and he requested that the donor just give us the entire Yale Library of Western Americana, that is, all their works on Western America, both fiction and biographical, that they give it all to us on microfiche. So I'm sure most of you in this room have not had the privilege of blowing your eyes out on microfiche, but uh, it is, it's a great, it's a great resource that we have. And believe me, you'll pick up how to use microfiche very quickly. It's not that hard. It's not nearly as easy as what you do now on the internet, but it's not that hard. And so we have thousands of books on microfiche from Yale. That's just what an incredible thing to have here. And so a lot of topics, if you do one of the more popular topics in here, uh, on one of the more popular figures like on Buffalo Bill Cody, there's going to be a lot on Cody in this. Or you want to do Stephen Austin in Texas, there's going to be a lot on Stephen Austin, primary sources, diaries, things that were written about him from, from Yale. And then we have other collections as well. Uh, Harper's Online. Harper's was one of the great, it's kind of like the, well, I was going to say it was the Time Life of its day, but you guys don't know Time Life. Um, it, it was one of the major magazines of the 19th century. Big, illustrated magazine that most Americans, if they took something, took Harper's Weekly, and we have all of that now online. JSTOR, of course, which is the great academic resource for the library. America History and Life, which is specifically an academic search for articles dealing with American history. And of course, other primary sources from the time, uh, from the time, like New York, the New York Times, the London Times, and the 19th Century Master File. So, what I would recommend is that once you've chosen a topic, and you don't have to consult with me about your topic, any of the topics that you want to choose from this list are perfectly fine. If there's something that's not on this list that you want to do, just email me. I'm sure it won't be a problem, but just let me know what it is. But once you've figured out your topic 
you should probably meet with one of the librarians and start working with them about the kind of resources that you need, uh, especially since MELCAT's down right now. It means that if you're going to have to get something through interlibrary loan, it's probably going to take a couple of extra weeks than it normally would. So just keep that in mind. I didn't know if you knew that, but so we're missing some of our major our major uh, resources at the moment. So it'll get fixed, but it's not there yet. So just keep that in mind and, and remember that some of these things might take a while uh, to come in. So start working on that now. Okay, I think that's it for the syllabus. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you were interested about some of the names on here, but I tried to, for the list of research topics, uh, I gave you everyone from an explorer. Alexander McKenzie was the very first person to cross all of North America. He did so about a decade before Lewis and Clark did it. Uh, Andrew Jackson, obviously president, but you would write on something dealing with his frontier, either his own frontier experience or his eyes, uh, his ideas on the frontier. Taylor Casas, one of the great explorers, Billy the Kid, a uh, very, very, very violent young man, uh, extremely violent. Black Elk was a Christian missionary, Catholic convert, American Indian, very interesting guy. Brigham Young, founder of Mormonism, uh, and we are going to do quite a bit on Mormonism in the class. Uh, one of the reasons I want to do that, and I, I'm not Mormon, I, and I told you that in the email, I didn't want anyone to think this is Brad trying to get everyone to convert or something. This is not. Um, I'm just I'm fascinated with Mormonism, and it's so deeply rooted in the American West. They, I, I don't know if this statistic is still true, but in the 1990s, something like 65% of all FBI career officers were Mormon because of the Salt Lake City headquarters of the Western FBI. I mean, that And Ronald Reagan refused to have any bodyguards who weren't Mormon. Uh, that, that's, that's amazing when you think about it. And to think about that kind of loyalty and what that is. And the story is incredible when you look at Brigham Young and you look at Joseph Smith. But it's also, it's a fully... And I, and I hope this isn't offensive. It just seems to me one of the most interesting things about Mormonism. It is a fully American expression of religion. It can't get more American than Mormonism. And the whole story takes place. The final great battle in Mormonism takes place in upstate New York. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. right? I mean, can you imagine if we had you know, Jericho? in, say, western Kansas. <laughs> That's, and, and so we don't think about that that often. But it, it all takes place right in North America. Not all of it, but most of it takes place in North and South America. So Charles Goodnight, one of the great cowboys. Charlie M. Russell, one of the great artists. Chief Joseph, great Native American. So really, there, I tried to give you a, a real diversity of personalities here. So just kind of look through the list, and if you're confused, you know, Dr. Burzo and a write on someone religious, I don't know who, I can get right back to you and say, I've got five figures on here that you may not be familiar with, but these would be possibilities. So don't hesitate to email me about any of these figures at all. Uh, I know the only person on here that I'm not that familiar with, and it was a suggestion from my wife, was Susan Shelby McGuffin. But uh, I know that she kept a diary on one of the trails, I think, on the Santa Fe Trail. So other than that, I'm pretty well conversant, uh, conversant in these guys. So just let me know if you're interested in which ones. Okay. All right, anything at all on the syllabus? Is it all pretty obvious? It's been a while since I've written the syllabus. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Well, let's, uh, if, you're gonna, if you're all okay, we'll just kind of jump into the class. So what I want to do today... Yeah, more than just give you the syllabus. In fact, that took longer than I would have liked. But what I want to do today is think about images of the American West. And again, because so much of what we understand about the American West has been defined by film, it means that we have all of these images about what the West is in ways that only at a place like Hillsdale would be, would be rivaled by our understanding of the American founding. So we at Hillsdale, we obviously love the founders. We love the founding. And so we have stories about the founding, lots and lots and lots of stories. The only thing equivalent in American history is our understanding of the West and what the West is. And so a huge part of what we're going to be doing this whole semester is not just looking at the reality of the West, but looking at the image of the West. Because it's very difficult 
from time to time, and almost always from time to time, it is very difficult to separate the image of the West from the reality of the West. And you get a person like, and I'll show a picture of him here in just a moment, or at least an aspect of him. You get someone like Buffalo Bill Cody, who's a frontier scout. And then once the frontier closes, he founds a huge entertainment industry. He creates the Wild West extravaganza that tours throughout all of North America and throughout all of Europe. It's the basis for all the first Westerns that come out of Hollywood. Well, what do you do with someone like Cody? He is both real and a fantasy all at the same time. And that's very typical when we look at the American West, that we're going to see that with all kinds of people. And even figures that we have incredible information about, like Chief Joseph. Chief Joseph is a Nez Perce chief. He was one of the great allies to America and then became one of the enemies to America, not by his fault, but through America's fault. It's going to be one of the great tragedies we talk about this semester. But when we remember him, as I mentioned, we still remember him as a Roman Stoic. So where do you separate the reality from the image? So here's the America, and you can see I stole this from freeworldmaps.net. But I want us to think about the West as essentially the entire United States, Canada, and Mexico. That is, I want us to think about it as North America. Because every single part of America was, at one point or another, an aspect of the frontier and a part of what would have been the American West for that point. And so, quite obviously for us, here up in Michigan, we often think of ourselves as a part of the old Northwest. Because, of course, it was the Northwest at one point. Not Seattle, not Portland, but Michigan. Hillsdale was at the heart of the Northwest at one point. And so we have this constant frontier that moves. And if we take the common story, as we talked about 30 minutes ago, if we take the common story, we start right off at Plymouth Rock, and we end up in L.A. And there is truth in that. There is a frontier line all the way from the very beginning of settlement, 1620 in New England, there is a line that runs from north to the south and moves from east to west. There is a frontier line that exists all the way until 1890. 1890, there's no frontier line left anymore. There's still tons of areas that are frontier, and still to this day, I mean, if anyone in here has ever traveled through extreme western, excuse me, uh, extreme eastern Oregon, but you've never seen anything so desolate in your life. Totally different from western Oregon and from Portland. It's just huge, huge swaths of blank space out there. And it's beautiful. It's incredible. But there's just nobody living there. So we still have frontier conditions throughout the United States, but we don't have that line of settlement, obviously, anymore, and we haven't since 1880, but we have pockets. So two dates I do want you to know. The very last homestead in America, that is the very last settlement that was taken in the 48 states, was in Montana in 1919. So the frontier we often think of as closing around 1890, but in fact, frontier settlement didn't end until 1919. And in Alaska, this is the other date I want you to know, in Alaska, the last homestead was taken up in 1934. So 1919 for Montana and Alaska for 1934. Again, that doesn't say doesn't mean that there aren't frontier conditions. And even in places, uh, especially in places along in the Great Plains that we're seeing a decline in population 10 years ago, places like my mom's hometown, which is just this little town in Kansas, they had empty lots and so they opened up homesteading again. Uh, it's a really smart thing to do for these tiny towns just to give away free property for people to come in and build homes. All she had to do was buy the pro or get the property and then build on it within five years, and that property is now hers completely debt-free. It's pretty amazing. So homesteading still goes on, but again, not in the way that we saw in the classic sense. But I also want you to think about the geography of America, and we're going to do a lot with this in this class. You know, we have the Appalachian Mountains here, and they seemed huge before anyone got to the Rockies. Once you get to the Rockies, the Appalachians seem pretty minor compared to the Rockies, and yet you still have to cross them. 
And crossing the Appalachians was never easy. It wasn't easy until Daniel Boone was able to figure out the Cumberland Gap. And the same thing is true for moving west until you're out in the Rocky Mountains and you're able to find certain kinds of places where you can move through relatively easily or by the rivers, you're not going to be able to settle. So it's going to take the same kind of process, the same thing we saw with Daniel Boone in the east, we're going to see with people like Jedediah Strong Smith and the mountain men in the west or Lewis and Clark, and they're going to have to try and figure out how to move. In the east, one of the things that we as Americans take for granted in the east is that we can almost always move throughout the east, and especially in the northern part of the east, on rivers. We have incredible river transportation throughout North America, but especially in the eastern half. Think about how much is watered by the Mississippi River. It's huge when you think about coming out of New Orleans, spreading out into all of the Old Northwest, and then of course even in the Appalachians in the south, you still have water transport. It's not easy to move internally within the south, but you can move from one area of the south to the ocean pretty quickly throughout much of the south. And so you always have, ac uh, you always have access to water transport. In the west, you don't have that. You have some huge rivers in the west, like the Snake and the Columbia, and of course the most important one, the Missouri. You have these huge rivers, but they don't lead really to internal movement within the West itself. You can move towards the Pacific, much like in the South, you can move towards the Atlantic, but you can't, for example, be up here in Bismarck, North Dakota, and end up in Santa Fe very easily. Very different, I can start in Indianapolis, or sorry, in Indianapolis, and end up in New Orleans, just by moving on a couple of different rivers, the White, and then the Ohio, and then the Mississippi. You can move internally in the east. You can't do that in the west. So the west is going to have certain things that will prevent it from being settled very easily, and yet it's settled very quickly. I mean, just imagine for a moment, when we're looking at this map, our first real settlement is, and when I say real, I mean this in the sense that you've got community, meaning men and women. So obviously in 1607, we have Jamestown in Virginia, but it's all men. And we don't have to get into biology 101. It's pretty clear that if you're a settlement of all men, you're not gonna actually create community over time. You have to have men and women. And the first time we see that is in 1620 in New England. Now think about that for a moment. In 1620, the very first real settlement on the New England coast and by 1880, this whole thing is covered in. I mean, we have never seen settlement happen as quickly as we do. And not just that, by 1848, everything that you see here in the 48 United States is a part of the United States, except for where Tucson is. We have to buy that, we buy that in 1853. But other than that, we have already filled in the continent. That's stunning. I mean, Thomas Jefferson in 1801 says it will take a thousand years for American settlement to reach St. Louis. From the point he says that, it takes 18 years. I mean, he is off by 981 years. That's incredible. And Thomas Jefferson may be the smartest man ever born on American soil. He gets that wrong. And we're going to have to talk about why is that the case. So we're in St. Louis and we're ready to bring Missouri in as a state by 1819. We've conquered all of this by 1848. That, that's it's incredible. And it may have happened too fast. When you think about the issues of slavery and what slavery is going to do, slavery is always mixed up with the West. Every time we get new land, is it free, is it slave? And it just opens up that huge division in America, that cultural division between the North and the South, it just makes that wound brutal over and over again. But we're going to talk about the different landscapes and what we see here. So here, a little bit more modern view. This is from the National Park Service. This is an attempt to get everybody, obviously, to go to the national parks. And you can see there is this kind of turquoise light blue where all the national parks are. There are national parks in the East. That's been something the National Park Service has been trying to push over the last 20 years. 
But prior to that, all the national parks were in the West. And it makes sense. This was land before it got closed in, land like Yellowstone or Yosemite or Colorado, Rocky Mountain National Park. These were areas that before they got settled, you could actually close off and prevent settlement. But you know, just imagine how busy there. You've got a blank slate. Not really, of course, because you've got the American Indians throughout. But you've got a relatively blank slate. But now, obviously, everything is settled. And you can even take various tours to move from one national park to another and explore all of that. So there's a lot going on. OK, so why, why the West? And what do we mean about myth here? This, by the way, is Kansas. I know probably most of you don't think of Kansas like this, but those are the badlands in western Kansas. Kansas is quite diverse and beautiful, actually uh, far different than what we often think. But And those are nothing compared to the Badlands and the Dakotas, but still uh, pretty, pretty beautiful. So one of my favorite scholars, a guy at the University of Houston, a man by the name of Donald Watts, incredible guy. For those of you who uh, have taken American founding with me, and we do a lot with Lutz as well, because he's actually a, a historian of the American founding. But he writes, very importantly, in his own understanding of the Constitution, essentially what they share are symbols and myths that provide meaning in their existence as a people and link them to some transcendent order. So the image that we have, I'll put up an image here of John Wayne in a bit. And my guess is that every one of us in this room will have some kind of intellectual and emotional reaction to that image, even if you've never seen a John Wayne film. He's so much a part of the 20th century air that we once, those of us in the room who were around in the 20th century, that we breathed. And it is just so much a part of a certain time and a certain culture. He has become, more than anything else, a myth and a symbol. And he links us not only to the past, but to one another as well. And we see this always in the West. The shared meaning and a shared link to some transcendent order allow them to act as a people. So these shared symbols that we have at Hillsdale, it would be probably the eagle or maybe George Washington's statue or maybe the Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher. But think about the symbols. Dr. Arn has been extremely good at promoting symbols on this campus, things that tie us together, or the Liberty Bell on the pocket constitution. Right? These are things that tie us not only to one another, but to the past and to the transcendent as well in one way or another. So Thomas Jefferson, and you guys all have this in, what, in American heritage, right at the very beginning of his first inaugural, 1801, what are we? And he here speaks with great humility, one of the few times in Jefferson's life he speaks with humility. What are we? We are a rising nation spread over a wide and fruitful land, traversing all the seas with the rich productions of their industry, and engaged in commerce with nations who feel power and forget rights, advancing beyond destiny, beyond the reach of the mortal eye. When I contemplate these transcendent objects and see the honor, the happiness, and the hopes of this beloved country committed to the issues and the auspices of this day, I shrink from the contemplation and humble myself before the magnitude of the undertaking. And no president, until we get to Eisenhower and Kennedy, no president promoted exploration more than Thomas Jefferson did. Thomas Jefferson's presidency for this class is defined by the Lewis and Clark expedition. It's defined by his exploration of the West. And the only thing, and none of you were around for this, three of us in this room were, but the only thing that's even equivalent in American history to what Jefferson did with Lewis and Clark is what we did in the 1960s with the moonshot. Uh, it is so rare in world history, ever, in any form of world history, where you have an entire society putting all their resources into the advancement of something like exploration or scientific knowledge. And in American history, we've done that twice. It's two things about America that make us exceptional. But nobody else except for China has ever tried anything like it. In China, this was back in the time of Cheng Ho in the early part of the 1400s. So only three times in world history have we seen these kind of commitments like this. And one of them is the Lewis and Clark expedition. We'll talk a lot more about that. But you can't praise Jefferson enough for what he did. This is a quote I didn't come across till last night as I was getting ready for class. 
uh, I was kind of boggled uh, by it. This is from Buffalo Bill Cody's program that he gave. So you get the program when you go watch his Wild West extravaganza. This was in the English program, hence the spelling that we have of civilization here. It is an equally true one that the bullet is the pioneer of civilization, for it has gone hand in hand with the axe that cleared the forest and with the family Bible and school book. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like something the NRA might put out. Uh, in fact, I would guess the NRA would be too timid to put out something like that. But there's Cody, and this is about 1893 when he says that. And yet, however uncomfortable that makes us feel, there's a lot of truth in what he says about this. And one of the most interesting things about Buffalo Bill and what he did with his show is he incorporated all of these former enemies of America, people like Sitting Bull, to come ride with him. And he gave them all equal wages. But he treated everybody. It didn't matter if it was Calamity Jane or Sitting Bull. He paid them the same and treated them all with deep respect, even though they're going out pretending that they're killing one another throughout all of these shows. It's, the shows are just basically one violent act after another. And one of the things that Buffalo Bill is so successful at in his Wild West show is he's successful in portraying American settlers as the victims, as opposed to the American Indian. And that's incredible to be able to kind of create an inversion there. But he's very successful in doing that. But you can see here, this is clearly, of course, the very circle of the program, the art here. But the Indian is extremely aggressive in trying to stop the progress of civilization. And, and you can see there from the TPs all the way to the, the way that the design is. And of course, there's Buffalo Bill who stands aloof from all of this and has this virtue about him. He's just a fascinating guy <laughs> every way. Someone who really had been there, had really done it, and then turns around and makes this his life. Ronald Reagan, 1985. This was from January 20th, 1985. A settler pushes west and sings his song. That's our heritage. That's our song. I remember Reagan's slogan was, it's always born in America. I, and there he is. He was, a, he was a B movie cowboy. This is how he got famous before he went off to General Electric and then went into politics. Uh, he was the Western. He was the B movie Western, but he was the Western. Everybody knew who Ronald Reagan was. Not just from playing the Notre Dame football movie, but from his Westerns. Right? Just, just incredible. But anybody know what would January 20th of 1985 be? What speech was this? Inauguration. Yeah, it's his second inauguration. Right? These are momentous speeches. And in the middle of it, he's defining America. And what are we? We are a nation of settlers. That's who we are. And this is a man who clearly came up in the West, even though it was Hollywood, but a West nonetheless. All right. I had to throw this in. Again, I'm dating myself, but a few of you smiled at this, so it's good. A 2003 science fiction show by the name of Firefly it only lasted about 13 episodes, and there were only 16 total made in one movie. But I love this. It's so Western. You can even look. I mean, here's the main character who's the captain of this spaceship. He looks like he's right out of the Wild West. And he is. And even the opening music to the story is Western music as the spaceship is corralling cattle. And here he is with his brown coat, which was supposed to be kind of like a Confederate figure. And he's got his six shooter there, even though this takes place hundreds of years from now. And he has this one moment in the opening show, at the very end of the first episode, where he looks at the young doctor, who's going to be a member of his crew. But he looks at the young doctor, and the doctor says something like, well, you could shoot me at any moment. Why would I want to be a part of your crew? Perfect Western answer. And this could have been John Wayne and the Searchers. This is the perfect Western answer. You don't know me, son, so let me explain this to you once. If I ever kill you, you'll be awake. You'll be facing me, and you'll be armed. I, it just doesn't get more Western than that. that. That is kind of the essence of the Western code. So there, even in science fiction, we find that. And there, there's actually, yeah, some of you, uh, if you took American Heritage with me, you'll remember this. But even Star Trek, which has obviously been around forever at this point, Star Trek was originally called Wagon Train to the Stars. 
It was meant to be a Western in space. And there's a reason that William Shatner was hired. He looks like John F. Kennedy. And that's why they picked him. Not because he's a great actor. He's a great guy. I think he's fascinating. But that wasn't because of his acting ability. They picked him to look like John F. Kennedy. So Star Trek is very much a part of this. And of course, you're transitioning there from the Western of the 1950s into the science, of science fiction of the 1960s, Lost in Space, another show at the time, has similar kind of Western themes as well. OK, so 10 myths that I want to talk about that help us kind of understand what the West is. And I'm going to give these in more or less chronological order. So the first one, and I just labeled it Atlantis. The first myth that we have about the West comes from Christopher Columbus, and it was from his encountering naked Native Americans. Because when he got to the Caribbean, they weren't wearing clothes. And so Columbus, being a very devout Catholic, first thing he does is he says mass the moment he lands in the New World. He doesn't say mass, but he has mass said. Columbus sees these Indians, and he's astounded, because if you take scripture seriously, the only people who have ever been properly naked without shame are Adam and Eve. And so Columbus is struck by this, and he has to make a decision, and it's going to take the Spanish and everybody else about 40 years to decide what's the case. But the great question is, are the American Indians somehow kind of a uh, pre-fallen people? Are they living in a maybe some form of Eden? Or are they in some way not human at all? Because those are the only two possibilities from a Judeo-Christian worldview of people running around without clothing. They have to either be innocent or they have to not be human. And so this was the great debate, and that debate will end in, in 1537 when Pope Paul III says, without question, Indians are human beings capable of salvation, endowed with free will and reason. At that point, even Protestants agree to end the debate. But it had been one of the major debates all through the early Reformation. How do we define the American Indian? But part of that myth, then, is this idea that what America really is, is this Western land that has been blessed in some way. And we still, Ronald Reagan, it's always morning in America. It doesn't matter if we're thinking about the New World as Eden, or if we're thinking about it with endless possibilities, as Reagan did, or John F. Kennedy's New Frontier, right? just constant expansion. Everywhere we go, there is this kind of limited, abil uh, unlimited ability to always remake something and have it be in the image that we so desperately want to be true. And you, know, you think about someone like Thomas More, Dr. Smith's great subject. And you think about Thomas More and Utopia, and what do you have? You've got this image of what's in the West, this island of perfection. And we see this over and over again. The first time it appears in Western civilization is in the Socratic dialogue with Timaeus, dealing with specifically this island called Atlantis. And it's a platonic myth. But it sticks for a very long time. And even as late as the late 1700s, you still have the Spanish looking in places for El Dorado, looking for the fountain of youth, of eternal youth. They're in California. And one of the reasons California is called California, in fact, the reason it's called California, is because it's named after an old Amazonian queen who supposedly led her Amazons to perfection, her Amazonians to perfection. Her name was Queen Khalifa. That's where California comes from. So this myth continues for a very long time really all the way up until about 250 years ago. So Atlantis, or the image of what the West is, as kind of ideal or utopia, has been there for a very long time. All right, but the second one is the opposite. See you guys. Thanks for thanks. Glad you're here. Excuse us. You guys are so disruptive. <laughs> so the second one is just the opposite, but it's called the Black Legend. And the black legend comes from reality, but it becomes mythological in a sense. Because what happens as the Spanish are debating how to treat the American Indian, they're also abusing the American Indian, and sometimes just horribly abusing 
the American Indian, as we see with the great, great Dominican priest, Bartolome de las Casas, who records all of the injuries that the Spanish are committing against the American Indian while they're still debating whether the Indians are innocent or whether uh, they're animals. And so they're often treated as animals, and brutally so. And I, I'm, I won't even go into any detail about it. You can just, if anything you can imagine as an atrocity, it was being committed against the American Indian by the Spanish. Now, that pretty much ends when the Pope declares the Indian to be a, a person in 1537. But the Spanish, in maybe their folly, had recorded all of the atrocities they had committed against the American Indian because they're trying to figure out if they should be doing this or not. So they have tons of written records which indicate just how horribly they're treating the American Indian. Well, when you get to the rivalry under Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I in England, and she knows that her main competition is Spain, she intentionally creates what's called the Black Legend. And she takes all of the documents from Spanish history and she begins to argue this is what the Spanish always do to the American Indian. They still, to this day, even in the 1580s, even though it's been since 1537, they're still treating the American Indian this way. And therefore, when the British are competing against the Spanish for property in North America, they're not just competing for Catholicism or Protestantism, they're competing for civilization itself. Do you want the Spanish to keep harming the American Indian? Of course not. So you want the English to go out and settle because they'll treat the Indians better. Now, in fact, the English treated the Indians just as poorly as the Spanish had and later, and we're doing things without recording it to the same extent that the Spanish had, but it makes a great story. And for many of us, this still, this black legend still comes in in the idea that we often think of New Spain, we think of the Spanish, as being kind of backwards. We think of them as not laboring really hard. I mean, all of this black legend stuff still plays it out, itself out in modern bigotry. It's pretty amazing to think about how much that plays out. And we'll see that in American history as well, especially in this class, when we look at one of the great literary historians of the 19th century, Francis Parkman. His whole history of civilization is based on Spanish repression versus English Protestant liberty. So Spanish Catholic darkness and English Protestant light. That's, that's fascinating. And we'll see that as a major theme throughout the 19th century. Okay, number three. What was called the passage. And it probably would be better to have put a map of America back up here. But there was an enlightenment belief, and I won't get into this too much because we'll talk about it more when we get to Lewis and Clark, But there was an enlightenment belief that beauty was always symmetrical. So always symmetrical. And that meant that if the eastern United States had a mountain chain and a huge river like the Mississippi River, then the west, to be beautiful and symmetrical with the east, also had to have a huge mountain chain and a river to match the Mississippi. And so they often talk about this as the passage which, of course, Lewis and Clark will somewhat find, but not really because there is no Mississippi on this side of the continent. But the passage was a belief that not only must there be symmetry and beauty, but God would never abandon the Chinese. Got to think about that. He would never abandon Asia just to Asia itself. There would have to be a means of Europe to get to Asia going in both directions especially because God would want the Asians to be Christianized. And that was the belief. And so these two things come together in the idea that there is no way in the Western United States that there is not a passage to India or a passage to China. It has to work that way, is how they thought of it. Now, this one is the one that is obviously the most wrong of almost everything that we're talking about here, but it's still, it's fascinating in the class that they're looking for that. And we wouldn't have the Lewis and Clark expedition Thomas Jefferson believed in this. I wouldn't have had that expedition without the intense search for the passage, trying to find that. All right, then we get to number four, what we call the Republican myth. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today because we're going to spend a lot of time on that throughout the whole semester. But the Republican myth is related to the myth of the passage. 
And it's the belief that God would not have abandoned any aspect or anything to just chance. And so what is the West? Well, God made the West. You see this all the way into Abraham Lincoln, especially during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But God made the West so that we could give Europeans the power to be small farmers. Everybody will be a property owner. Everybody will be a king of their own little patch of land. And this is the Republican belief, and it starts really in America. It's earlier than Jefferson, but it's Jefferson who really gives it that teeth, especially through the Lewis and Clark expedition, that this idea that somehow God has given us this land to do something with it. And believe me, it's not to create a democracy. It's to create a republic. And that republic will be a republic of small farmers. That is the goal. And Jefferson is definitely, there's no question, this is one of his anti-slavery motives. Jefferson is always mixed on slavery. His policies are always extremely anti-slavery, but personally, of course, he's a slave owner and not always a very nice one uh, by any means. But his theory is we have to be able to out-compete these large plantation owners. We can only do that by having millions of small farmers who can then outweigh the plantation owners in the South. So that's part of the goal. This is obviously Thomas Jefferson right here. You're probably not as familiar with this person, but he's not, I won't say he's equally fascinating, but he's fascinating in and of himself. This is James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote one of the very early Republican novels in American history. He wrote five of them, but one of them, most famous, was called Last of the Mohicans. And the Last of the Mohicans, the reason it's the last of the Mohicans, is it's trying to kind of transfer American Indian natural republics to an American civilized republic. The Indians are primitive republicans as opposed to civilized republicans in Cooper's understanding. So I had to throw this in as well. I just, first time I'd ever seen one, I saw this this summer in South Dakota. This is a medal. Thomas Jefferson had several of them made. It's a medal that Lewis and Clark took out and gave to one of the various Indian chiefs that they encountered. So the medal's about this big, and it, it has Jefferson's seal on it, and it was meant to create a kind of Republican alliance with all of the tribes that Lewis and Clark encountered. It's pretty neat to see. I've read about them all my life, but <laughs> the first one is the buying glass, so I couldn't touch it, but it's uh, pretty amazing. Okay, number five. Now we're getting into Dr. Gamble territory here. The idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is related very much to republicanism, but it's republicanism that has been taken, as C.S. Lewis would say, it's been exploded to madness in some way. It's taken into a direction that it was never meant to be. So Jefferson, when he argued that we would be a republic of small farmers, meant that the small farmers would go out and break the land and create the farms for themselves. Jefferson doesn't send the military out to do that. He sends the military out to explore. That's what the military does. But the military is not used, not meant to be fighting against the American Indian. That's something that the farmer will have to figure out on his own. Daniel Boone wants to go west. Good luck. Someone else wants to go west. Good luck. We'll see what happens when you encounter the American Indians. Maybe you'll become friends with them. Maybe you'll intermarry with them. Maybe you'll kill each other. But whatever it is, it's all incredibly decentralized. Manifest Destiny comes along in the 1830s, so a good 25 years after Jefferson's in office, or 20 years after Jefferson's in office. Uh, No, 25 years, right. And Manifest Destiny comes in, and it argues what Jefferson wanted was great, but we'll never be able to accomplish it without the use of military force. So Jefferson's idea of private farmers doing this and private families doing this is really kind of a neat idea, but it hasn't worked. And therefore, we need the U.S. military to fight the Indian, to restrict the Indian, to put the Indian on reservation, to move the Indian. And this is where we get policies like removal, uh, policies that we take the American Indian from their native land and move them out to places like Kansas and Oklahoma. Yeah. So, What's your name? Uh, Ethan. Ethan. Um, thanks. So, does th- this sort of sort of shift in thinking of, of like you know that peacefully like well you know a, a lot of like decentralized like settlement um, kind of gets rejected? 
Is that more more kind of in response to like the War of eighteen twelve, seeing like a mass alliance of Native American states against the the US? War of eighteen twelve had a lot to do yeah. with it, uh, it militarily too, because yeah. we moved from kind of a country of militias <laughs> to a centralized. So yeah, the War of eighteen twelve plays a huge role in this, and then it's one of the reasons that I assigned Tecumseh to you as well, because Edmonds deals with this question to a certain extent, how we start seeing ourselves especially in relation to the military. But then it's a great question, Ethan. And the military really does become much more powerful after this way of thinking, and we start using it. So not only will we use the military to gain all of northern Mexico, but we start using the military to move the Indian, we start using the military to contain the Indian as well. And that's all part of this movement, which, I mean, you think about even the title. What a, what a creepy title. God's will for you is being made manifest here. I mean, this is what an interesting thing, right? By itself, but manifest destiny is destined, is made manifest, right? This ideal that we have to control this. And so part of this was, look, it's inevitable that we're going to control all of this, everything from one coast to another. So why not hurry it up? So that's part of it as well. There was another hand. Something else? Yeah, did you hear? Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Alex. Alex, thanks. I was going to ask about you know the, the whole idea, the way that I learned about Manifest Destiny was that it was the idea that God gave us this land to take over and to rule. Um, so I was just asking, sure. before you had gotten to that point. And yeah, no, absolutely. And so it is ours. It's already ours. And Jefferson, he thought the land was ours too. He just thought it was going to take a while to process it and make it ours. So this is really Jeffersonianism with military might. That's why I, mean, I would call it, and I don't want to use too many religious terms here, but really manifest destiny is kind of a heresy of republicanism. It, it's still republicanism, but given kind of democratic form and violent, real violence. Maybe not democrat, but populist. Kind of a populist tinge to it. So, does that help? Okay, great question. Okay, number six. Now we just get into full-blown kind of nationalism. So Manifest Destiny happens in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. After the American Civil War, so if the War of 1812 moves us towards Manifest Destiny, the Civil War moves us towards nationalism. And now we start thinking in terms of nation states. And it also means when we are no longer just a republic, we're not sure how to deal with the Indians. When we were a republic, the Indians were also republics. They were primitive republics, and we were a civilized republic, and we could deal with them as republicans. But once we start thinking of ourselves as a nation, we don't really know exactly how to deal with the Indians, because they aren't really nations, but yet there is something to them. And we often think of the Indian nations. There's something to them. And so if we are a nation, it means that somehow we have to incorporate the Indians but they have to become kind of subject to us as well. And we see nationalism arise very strongly after the Civil War, very strongly. Uh, and we see it rise in people like one of the great Westerners, Teddy Roosevelt. Now he's from New York, but he spends his summers and part of his time out in the West in the Dakotas as a rancher. And really, I think many of his own virtues and his character comes out of his Western experience. And he's a great writer. But this kind of nationalist, what we would also call progressive, this vision really starts taking hold under Ulysses S. Grant as president, but then throughout the presidents, not Grover Cleveland, but the other presidents that we have in the Gilded Age, in that last part of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century. And then all of you had your American Heritage course. You'll remember Teddy Roosevelt's 1910, The New Nationalism. And think about it, if you remember, he draws upon the West, he draws upon the Civil War experience, I mean, all of that becomes kind of a new way of thinking. And nation you know, was a term that was around during the founding, but it was only used in a very specialized way. People like George Washington used it, but he also used it interchangeably with capital C country, which had kind of mystical overtones to it. So nation that Washington talks about is not the nation that Teddy Roosevelt talks about. They're different, even though they use the same language. They have very different meaning. So out of this, 
And importantly, and we're going to talk a lot about this during the class as well, we do a lot with Republicanism and a lot with progressivism, but out of this, the most important figure we get is a scholar by the name of Frederick Jackson Turner, who writes the ultimate kind of progressive nationalist manifesto about the West. And you all, again, you should have read it during Western uh, American heritage, this idea of what is the frontier, well, the frontier is the place of most rapid Americanization. It's where the European meets the Indian and becomes something new, becomes this American. And his, his whole element, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, it's all straight Hegelian progressivism. And we're going to get into that more. But I want you at this point just to understand where that kind of fits in and comes into this. And then we do this kind of weird thing that nobody would have expected. We suddenly become really taken with Hispanic culture. And you see a little bit of this in Hillsdale along Main Street. But in my hometown in Kansas, even though it's in Kansas, all the wealthy houses were done in this style. This is a 19 teens, late 19 teens, early 1920s style called Hispanic Revival or Spanish Gothic, Spanish Revival. And it was a huge movement in architecture, but not just in architecture. It was an extremely anti-progressive movement in architecture and in culture because what it said was, we used to kind of mock Hispanic culture for being lazy and so forth, people taking siestas in the afternoon. Now that we've become so mechanized and so industrialized, now it kind of seems like they actually have the key to life. That in fact, we do really need to rest. We do really need to understand what this is. And so we have this revival, this Spanish revival. It's incredible. And it becomes, and plus, you know, we have also massive immigration coming in from Mexico at this point. Uh, and we'll, we'll all the way, you know, there, there's no prohibition on anyone coming from Latin America until 1964. 1964 is the first time ever in American history that there's a prohibition. It was always an open border between the U.S. and Mexico up until 1964. So much like what we had with Canada and did up until the Patriot Act. Uh, so you know, a lot of things have changed, but certainly this revival. Now, what's important here, one of the greatest novels of American history came out as a part of the Spanish revival called Death Comes for the Archbishop. Right? So that's one reason I'm having you read it, because it's kind of the defining moment of the Spanish revival. And then it all goes to hell. <laughs> but it does. Uh, everything goes wrong, and we go into depression. And then we get a yet new image of the West. And I'm almost done here. But we get this new image of the West, and it's one that comes from Frederick Jackson Turner, because he was the professor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt at Harvard. And what Franklin Delano Roosevelt took from his professor, Frederick Jackson Turner, was that the frontier was over. And therefore, because the frontier is over, we have only very limited resources left in America. And the New Deal is not socialist, it's managerial. That is, the job of the New Deal is to manage the few resources that are left in the West. That's its job. And it's very focused on the West. It's focused on cattle, it's focused on Western minerals, it's focused on Western forests. Uh, the New Deal is very focused on it because it believes that we've now lost all of that. And that's why it's so weird we think of someone like John F. Kennedy in the same breath because he's part of the same party as Franklin Roosevelt. John F. Kennedy is the exact opposite of Roosevelt. John F. Kennedy believes that there are limitless resources, and that's why he names his administration the New Frontier. Everything's open again. All that's off the table now that we're out of the Depression. You don't have to deal with that. All right, it's John Wayne. Anybody have a reaction? You're supposed to. So, John Wayne, the ultimate Western figure in the 20th century. A classic. This is a, an image taken from one of his best movies called Stagecoach, an incredible movie, 1939. I think one of the greatest movies ever made. But certainly, uh, there he is Johnny Ringo, an outlaw trying to make good. And a you know, classic story, classic Western. Really, everything is in it is, is just taken there. And you can see the landscape behind him, the great American Southwest, huge open spaces. 
And, and just think about that kind of image of manliness, which is so important during World War II and after, especially when we're fighting the, the Soviets uh, in the Cold War. We need those images, those incredible images of kind of heroism that's there. Or we get into more modern Hollywood. Not always so manly. I like Kevin Costner, but he doesn't look so manly. Either. Anyway, so I had to throw that in as a joke. Okay, finally, the last part of the West, the last kind of myth, great myth we had, and this is in the 1980s. Now it may even be true, but in the 1980s, the Southwest was kind of a bastion of lunacy where you have crystals and all kinds of New Age religion and UFOs, right? Now maybe the UFO stuff seems to be somewhat real at this point. But look, heavenly Sedonia, northern Arizona. And um, you can experience the miracle you are in places like Sedona. I mean, healing, readings, more, all of this. This became a huge part of the West when I was a kid. This kind of image of I mean, enchanted fairies and angels and crystals. I guess with my love of Tolkien, I can't bash this too much. Uh, but anyway, uh, definitely a huge part of this. And then, we don't know where we are. We haven't really had a great image of the West since we had that kind of 1980s image, and that's part of what we'll talk about this semester. Okay, anybody have any final thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, on the... Uh the return to paradise, like once when you know America something like gets to sure. the Gothic architecture again, is that a predominantly Catholic reaction, or is it kind of an across the board? It's reaction? across the board. There's uh, I mean, during the 1920s, you see this. I mean, it definitely like places in the Southwest are going to be more prone to it than mm -hmm. elsewhere. So where you have large Hispanic settlement, yeah. you're going to have it. But it became the fashionable thing among all kinds of people, and people really questioning. You know, what are we doing with all these factories? What are we doing with our time being regulated to the nth second? You know, what, what's going on here? So it, it was a boost for Catholicism. There's no question about that. But it was happening everywhere, not just in the Catholic Church, but definitely everywhere. Yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone. So I won't see you now for, what, five days. So I'll see you on Tuesday. And